We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to Easter at ACC. We pray that today, wherever you may be, that you feel God's great love, power, and presence in your life. We don't want you to just watch the service. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. Get ready to experience Easter at ACC and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Great to see you all here this morning. You know, my favorite thing about Easter Sunday is that it's a celebration of life and peace and not a celebration of fear and death. And man, uh, there's a lot of, of, of fear in this world, isn't there? There's a lot of things that we fear. In fact, let's take a quick little poll. I'm going to ask you to be honest with me for just a moment. Some of the most popular fears. How many of you are willing to admit, raise your hand if you're afraid of snakes? All right, we've got some, some snake phobia in here. Uh, how about, how many of you are afraid of uh, heights? You don't like to be high places. Maybe you don't even get in an airplane because you're like, no, nope, not doing that. Uh-uh. How many of you are afraid of germs? Any germaphobes in here? My wife, put your both hands up. Both hands. There you go. All right. Uh, how, about, how about a pretty popular one? How many of you are afraid of spiders? All right. Now, believe it or not, uh, I'm, I'm the only guy in my house. So I got three daughters and my wife and even our dog's a girl, right? So I'm, I'm uh, for some reason, I'm designated spider killer. And I don't like spiders either, but I have to pretend uh, that I don't mind them all that much. So uh, I wrote down a few others. Let me see. How many of you are afraid of the dark? Some of you are willing to admit that. You know, a lot of people, that's a fear that maybe you had when you were a kid and you have grown out of it. But we all know there's that moment, right, where you're the last person who's heading to bed and there's one light switch on in the house that's still on. And you're responsible for flipping that bad boy off, right? And so you're like standing there, uh, and you're like, all right, got to get all the way over there. And you hit it, and you're like, ah! right? And you, as quickly as you can, you get out of that darkness, because we all kind of have a little bit of fear of the dark. Uh, how about a fear of public speaking? Anyone afraid of public speaking? I know, me too. Just kidding, no. Actually, you know, one of my fears is related to public speaking. I do two things before I come up on stage. I say a quick prayer, and I check my zipper. <laughs> because I've done that before. That's definitely a fear of mine. Um, but you know one of the fears that most of us have in common? You might have a little bit less of it than others. It's a fear called thanatophobia. You might not know what that is, but it's the fear of death. And you think about it, you might be thinking, well, I'm not really afraid of death. You know, I, I don't mind. I know, whatever. But it, it, at the end of the day, we all probably don't want to die like a painful death, right? We don't want to die before we, before we think we should. Sometimes our fear of death is related to other people. We're afraid that someone we know or love is going to die, and that scares us, right? So this concept of death is something that brings about some fear. In fact, we actually see in Psalm 90, verse 10, it says, 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80. But when the best years, even the best years are filled with pain and trouble, soon they disappear and we fly away. So what is the Bible saying? The Bible's saying that if you're 70, 80 already, you're living on borrowed time. No? <laughs> no, here's what it's saying. It's saying all of us, some of you are going to live to 100, maybe more, some of, you, some of us are going to die younger than 70 or 80, and we're going to die young. But all of us share something in common, and that we're all mortal. We're all going to die. And the reason why is because of sin, right? Sin entered this world all the way back in the garden. Adam and Eve brought sin into this world. And, and you and I, we can't just blame them. All of us, we got sin going on in our own lives. We all bring our own problems and brokenness into this world. And because of this sin problem, we have now this mortality problem. All of us are going to die. All of us experience uh, a little bit of a fear of what that's like and what the, when that's going to happen. And, and, but the best thing about Easter Sunday is that it's a celebration not of death, not a celebration of fear, but a celebration of life and of peace, right? In fact, I want you to know this. Even after Jesus died, 
and he was resurrected, there was already witnesses to his resurrection. In fact, Mary had already told the disciples, listen, Jesus is alive. Uh, So Jesus is already resurrected from the dead in this verse I'm about to read. In John 20, it says that Sunday evening, so Jesus has already conquered death, it says that Sunday evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were what? They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. You see, that's the uh, kind of the Easter story in a little bit of a, a tight little bundle. There's fear, and then Jesus enters into the picture alive, and he says, hey, listen, peace be with you. You don't have to to be afraid anymore. You don't have to worry and wonder about death anymore. I'm bringing peace, and I'm bringing life. And so we celebrate peace and life on Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, we actually celebrate three different resurrections on Easter. Did you know that? Most of you in this room right now, you're thinking, I know of one resurrection that we we woke up this morning to celebrate. Uh, But what do you mean there's three of them? Well, I'm going to share with you three resurrections of Easter and then we're going to take communion together and then we're going to uh, see some baptisms and and we're going to sing some songs all right that's the plan first resurrection of Easter is the one you all know about right it's this Jesus was resurrected say that with me Jesus was resurrected now say it again but at the end tell me how excited you are about that you ready Jesus was resurrected Woo! that's right and here's why we ought to be really excited about that resurrection. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says that the resurrection of Jesus is the most important of all resurrections. Because if Jesus didn't conquer death, there would be no reason for us to gather here right now. There would be no other resurrections. The resurrection of Christ makes all other resurrections possible. So this is the most important one. Jesus was resurrected. That's important news. It's important to understand that. Now, some of you in this room, you might be thinking, well, I don't believe that. I don't even know much about Jesus. I, I just showed up today out of a favor to my, my mom or my grandma or my parents or whatever. You, 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 someone dragged you here today. Well, let me, let me tell you a couple things that we know about Jesus that all of us should be able to agree on. One thing that we know about Jesus is that he actually existed. 2,000 years ago, There was a real man named Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah, who claimed to be the Son of God who had come to this earth to forgive people's sins. That person actually existed. Even atheists will agree that Jesus existed. In fact, one of the leading atheists of our day, Richard Dawkins, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. Clearly, he doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe what we believe, all right? He wrote this book called The God Delusion, and in the book, he actually wrote the line that Jesus never existed. And he got so much flack. Historians, other atheists, and people, the atheists were actually writing to him saying, listen, if you make a claim like that, which we all know isn't true, nobody's going to take anything in your book seriously. So Richard Dawkins, in an interview, actually said, I retract it, I shouldn't have written it, Jesus did exist. So everyone knows that Jesus actually existed. Now, the the question we have, if Jesus actually existed and he claimed to be the Messiah, he claimed to be the Son of God, the question we have to ask is, was he telling the truth? He was either a liar, maybe he was crazy, right? He was a lunatic. But the third option, that he was telling the truth, that he's the Lord, that he deserves a spot in your life as Lord of your life. Now, if he conquered death, and he wasn't a liar, and he wasn't a lunatic. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. Now, now, I know some of you are still skeptical. You're like, well, I, I don't know if I believe that he came back to life. I believe there's a real guy who said he was going to come back to life, but I, I don't know if he really did. Let me read some more scripture to you. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, it says, <clears throat> this is after his resurrection, it says, after resurrecting, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve, And then after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. This is when Paul was writing this, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him, Paul says. 
So you have, again, a uh, written account in Scripture, historical uh, you know, understanding of, of the, the Bible, that Jesus, after he was resurrected, there were hundreds of people that will testify to the idea that the tomb was empty, that they saw a resurrected Christ. We saw him die, and then we saw him alive. Hundreds of people saw this. Again, you, you might be thinking, well, that's just what your Bible says. That's not like an accurate historical document. But here's one thing you can do. You can go back and look in the history books. I've actually walked into the room where, where St. Peter, right, one of Jesus' closest friends, was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way his Savior was. Why was Peter crucified upside down? Why was he killed because they gave Peter an option. They said, Peter, we don't believe you. Would you just tell everyone that this whole thing is a scam, that you never saw Jesus alive? You're writing all this stuff. You're telling people stuff. Admit it right now. Or we're going to kill you. And Peter, just like the other disciples who were also martyred for their faith, said, I can't. I saw with my own eyes. Many of us in this room, we wouldn't even be willing to, to like, live for a lie. Would you be willing to die for a lie? Would you be like, oh, this would be the funniest scam. I'm just going to tell people something I made up and then die for it. No. Jesus really resurrected from the dead. Now, you have to decide for yourself whether or not you believe that, but the first resurrection of Scripture is, is clear. Jesus, the invisible, the image of the invisible God, he came to this earth, he died on the cross, a painful, agonizing death. For a couple days there, Satan thought he was in control. And then Jesus conquered death and rose again. That's the first resurrection we celebrate on Easter Sunday. Here's the second one. All right, the second resurrection that we're celebrating today is that you can be resurrected. I hope you know that. I, I want you to know why I worded it this way. I didn't say that you will be resurrected because there are some of you in this room that will choose not to be resurrected. You will choose to, to live in, in, in the state that you're in right now pre-Christ and you will not be resurrected from the dead. You will remain dead. And so I want to explain the difference between those two groups of people. I, I want you to, the, first let me show you in scripture. In Ephesians 2 verse 1 it says, you were once dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, Paul's writing to a church of believers. He's writing to Christians, and he's saying to them, you once were dead. He's not just talking about just a physical death, but a spiritual death. You, you were separated from God because of your sin. And then he goes on in verse 4, he says, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. You see, what this verse tells us is that because Jesus conquered death one day by placing your faith in him, by letting Jesus cover the price for your sin in your life, one day God will see you as holy and perfect, just like his son, and you will be able to live forever resurrected. You too, friends, listen to this, can be resurrected into new life. I want you to, to imagine this word, this kind of picture uh, up here. I have this big rug. Let's imagine that this rug represents a, a large uh, canyon. All right, there's this, this canyon over here. And, and before, before there was a canyon, you, uh, mankind, and God lived in perfect harmony. So imagine that you, uh, back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they walked around the garden. Everything was at peace. Animals were at peace. Humans were at peace. We were at peace with God. Everyone was living in community. It was beautiful. And then what did Adam and Eve do? They introduced sin into the world. They decided they were going to do things their own way by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of doing things God's way. And what it did is it created this huge rip, this huge cavern, or this uh, not cavern, ca ca uh, canyon, right? This huge uh, space between where we are, here, here's the world, here we are in our brokenness, and now God is over on the other side. And the reason why we have this problem is because God is perfect, the Bible says. He is perfect light, and in him there is no darkness. 
If God were to stay in relationship with us the way we are in our sin, if God were to allow me into heaven with my sin, I would ruin it. It would no longer be a perfect place. God will not put up with sin. He, he, he's perfect, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we have this problem where you and I, we're stuck on this side of this problem because of our sin, and God is over there. But here's the beautiful thing about the gospel is God loves you. God looks to the other side of this canyon, and he sees people that he loves. He sees you, and he says, I want to be in a relationship with you, but there's this brokenness so he comes up with a plan that only God could come up with. And he says, listen, I'm going to send my son. And he's going to become, though he is right now immortal, I'm going to allow him to become mortal for you. He's going to come and he's going to live a mortal life. And he's going to do what none of us could do. He's going to live perfect. He's never going to sin his entire 33 years of existence on this planet physically. He's going to do it all without sin. And then he's going to die on a cross. And I want you to picture now this giant cross that's now bridging the gap between where you are and where God is. And God simply says, listen, Jesus, we already know, we sung about it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, the Bible says. The only way we can be restored to the Father is through Jesus' death on the cross. We can use the cross as a bridge over to the other side of the canyon and be reconnected with God. God will let Jesus pay the price for our sins so that when we come across the other side, we are no longer broken, sinful people. But God sees the beauty and perfection of his son. Now, I, I recognize this past week we experienced in this in this community, a pretty big tra uh, tragedy, right? We, we, we saw the Francis Scott Key Bridge unexpectedly. No one expected this to happen. Some people woke up the next morning and wait, what? What just happened? The bridge is down. And it's a, it's a travesty for a lot of different reasons. It's a tragedy in that, uh, one, there's, there's people who lost their lives and there's families that are hurting right now. There are a lot of people that are employed in the ports and in the cruise lines and all this. It's going to affect our economy. A lot of terrible things, and we certainly, you know, it, it, was, it was painful to watch with that, what, all that's going on there. But just like that bridge is no longer bridging the gap from one side of the Chesapeake to the other, I want you to know that the bridge of the cross, the opportunity you have through Jesus to move from death to life, that bridge will also not always be available to you. You see, the, the moment you stop breathing, the moment you stop uh, thinking and, and, and your heart stops beating, the moment you die, all of us are mortal beings, the moment that you die, that bridge goes away. You are either on one side or the other at that point. You've already made your mind up at that point whether or not you want to go across the bridge into newness of life or whether or not you want to stay over here. Now, a lot of us, we, we spend time over on this side, and we try to find joy over here. We try to find meaning. We try to find purpose. And we try everything. The world promises all sorts of solutions. Hey, you don't need to go across this bridge. Just try this. Try some drugs. Try some alcohol. Try some sex. Try some uh, food. Try some whatever. And the, the, the world promises you all sorts of things over here. And the truth is, we've, we've all tried a lot of these things, and they do bring some temporary joy. They bring some temporary happiness. But we've all learned that those things run out real quick, and the only way to find true joy and true happiness is by taking the bridge of the cross through Jesus Christ to the other side of the canyon. You, too, can be resurrected. Colossians 1.19 says, For God is... In all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, right, through the cross, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Such a powerful reminder. You've probably heard of the verse John 3.16, right? Even if you're not a church goer, you've probably learn this verse at some point, or someone told you this verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, 
that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Right, well, I want you to think about that verse in a different way for just a moment. I wrote it slightly differently. It's still accurate to the text, but listen to this. The immortal God so loved the mortal world that he gave his immortal son to become a mortal for us so that through him we too can become immortal. You see, that's the promise of of Scripture. That's the promise of the gospel, that you too can be resurrected. My question for you in this room, I want everyone to, to process this question for just a moment. Have you ever given your life to God? Have you ever taken the bridge from one side, uh, from death over to life? Have you taken Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I want you to really consider that question because that bridge is not always going to be available to you. When I say that Jesus was resurrected, that's already happened, but you can be resurrected if you choose to take that bridge while it's available to you. Now let me share with you the third resurrection. This one might be a bit of a surprise to you. Number three, The church will be resurrected. The church will be resurrected. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. Some of you are thinking, well, didn't you just cover that, number two? Like, believers, we are the church. We're part of the bride of Christ. We're going to be resurrected. We got it. We already covered that. I want you to think about this from a different angle. Number three, the church will be resurrected. Let me show you a picture real fast of a desert. This is called the Namib Desert in Africa. You see this picture here. Uh, This is a desert that's vast. If you were to try to cross it, you would have to have a lot of equipment and supplies and water because it's essentially dead. There's there's no life here. You look at this desert and it it symbolizes, in a way, there's nothing alive in this place. But, But believe it or not, there's actually some life here. You just, you can't see it. Every once in a while, in the Namib Desert, there's a rain, and when it rains in the Namib Desert, photographers from all over the world flock to this desert to ga- gather a picture or two, because this is what it looks like a couple days after a rain. See, for a lot of us in this room, everything seems dead. There seems to be no life. You, you seem to be stuck in, in a pattern of of things that aren't bringing any joy or purpose in your life. But I want you to know that underneath the surface, there's a, there's a seed, there's a, there's a yearning, there's something in your heart that longs to come to life. And, and, and through just a little bit of water, through some, through some rain, God wants to bring new life into your, into your experience. I want to share with you a graphic that when I saw it a couple of weeks ago, it it brought chills to, to my, my body. I hope it does the same for you. Just let me show this to you. We have these movements um, called the, the Great Awakenings. And let me explain first what a Great Awakening is. In the American church, there are these moments in time where we've seen a revival, where, where what seemed to be dead where churches were kind of plateauing. Nobody was really in a place where they were, uh, we saw a lot of people giving their lives to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, there was a great awakening, a revival within the church. And, and when you study church history, these moments are called these great awakenings within the church. And the first great awakening is right here. It was in 1730. It lasted for about 10 years. And, and uh, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitefield, they were kind of the leaders of this movement, and they saw hundreds of thousands of people giving their life to Christ uh, when before it just kind of seemed like that desert before. It seemed dead. And so we had this great awakening in the church. And then, let's fast forward 50 years, uh, you have the second great awakening. Again, you go and study church history, you'll see the charts where, where these things happen, where people, again, hundreds of thousands of people giving their life to Christ in these short periods of time. And so the Second Great Awakening lasted probably the longest from 1790 to 1850 under the leadership of Charles Finney. We saw, uh, again, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people giving their life to Christ, a revival. Uh, the church was coming alive, if you will. All right, and then let's fast forward again. Uh, we have another 50 years and then the Third Great Awakening. In the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, there was a pastor named D.L. Moody, 
and he, he brought about this revival that spread in the region, uh, the north, uh, mid, mid, mid east, um, Chicago area, all right, and spread out from there and all uh, affected the entire country. This another great awakening we call the third great awakening in the church. And then let's fast forward again another 50 years to the fourth great awakening. Now, some of you were, were part of this great awakening. From 1960 to, to 1974, the evangelist Billy Graham was doing these uh, things all over this country, these huge revivals, and people were given there hundreds of thousands of people. The church saw just exciting growth. Now, some of you have already figured out this math. You already know where I'm going, huh? 50 years, 50 years, 50. Well, what, is, what is 1974 plus 50 years? Let's see. Here's what I'm trying to get at. The church is due for revival. And it's a revival that's only a possible because Jesus conquered death. And because Jesus conquered death, you too can conquer death. And because you have conquered death, there's this there's a stirring that happens occasionally within the, the American church where we're seeing a revival of people get excited about what God's doing in their lives. And we're seeing hundreds of thousands of people coming to know Christ. I was at a, a conference about a month ago with my wife. And we were talking to churches that were in a similar place as ours and hearing stories about a greater n- number of people than ever before coming to know Christ more baptisms, record number of people walking into the church, hearing the truth and giving their life to Jesus than ever before. And we're looking at a chart like this saying, this is, this is another great revival that's starting right now. We're at the, the beginning of it. And we actually see this at Arundel Christian Church. I mean, we, we baptized more people in this past year than we've ever baptized before in a previous year. We've, we've grown as a church by 55% in a single year. We're talking like revive. Can you imagine the church growing by 55% in this country in a single year? What kind of revival that would be? How exciting that would be to see happen? Just even looking at Easter the last three years here at Arundel Christian Church, you know, we're going to have the opportunity to celebrate some baptisms this morning. Some of you are in this room and you don't even know it yet, but you're going to get baptized today. I'm not going to force anyone to get baptized. You're like, oh, I hope he doesn't pick me. Like, I'm not, no, no. On Easter Sunday, we, we present the gospel clearly to people. And we give them an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And we always put a couple songs at the end of the message so that anybody who's like, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus today. And I want to take that initial step of obedience and get baptized today. You can do that. We got shorts, shoes shirts, flip-flops, towels. We got everything you could need to get baptized today if God's calling you to do that. In the last three years, three years ago, we did this, and we had two people spontaneously get baptized on Easter Sunday. Two years ago, we had 10 people spontaneously on Easter Sunday get baptized. Last year, we had 18 people on Easter Sunday spontaneously get baptized. And this year, we're only two services in. You guys are the third service of four. We've already baptized 10 people and seen, uh, I think, another five give their life to Jesus. (laughs) Here's why I say that, is there is a resurrection that's happening. The the church is, is in a revival season right now. Not just Arundel Christian Church, but all over the globe. And I would love for you to be a part of it. The church is coming alive. Now, we always end our messages with the simple question, of what now, God? What do we do with this information? And I want to I ask you to consider a couple things. One, if you are a brother or sister in Christ, if you are in this room and you've already made a decision to follow Jesus, the what now for you is pretty simple. It's two things. One, I hope right now you're sitting in a spirit of gratitude for the fact that Jesus died on the cross and then conquered death for you so that you can be resurrected too. That's the first thing. Be thankful for what Jesus has done for you. The second thing I would ask you to do, in light of that chart we just saw on the screen, I'm going to ask you throughout the rest of this year to buckle up and get ready for what God's about to do here. Now for those of you in this room who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. You're still on this side of the canyon. You're trying all the things the world promises to bring you purpose and meaning and joy. 
you've tried all those things, and you're at the point right now where you know none of those things are working, I'm going to give you an opportunity in about 60 seconds, okay, to do something very, very bold. It's going to take a lot of courage. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to say, I want to make a decision to walk across the bridge that is available to me through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and I want to step into new life with Christ. Now, a lot of churches, they make this really easy. They have everybody bow their heads, and then they have everybody who wants to make a decision raise their hand, and you get to kind of do it in the quietness and the kind of the secrecy of where you are. Well, we're a little different here at Arundel Christian Church because we're bold. Yeah, we're bold. I promise you, if you're embarrassed of your faith in this room, you're really going to struggle out there, okay? And so if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus today, you've got about, uh, in about 30 seconds now, okay? I'm, I don't know if I'm great on my time management, but it's coming. What I'm going to invite you to do is stand up where you are in front of everybody. Their eyes are going to be open. The lights are on. Everyone's going to see you. And you're just going to come, and you're going to stand up here. And, and listen, you might think, well, what if I'm the only one? What if I'm the only one who does that? Listen, I know that might seem very bold. It might seem like it takes a lot of courage. But I want you to know that when this room starts clapping because you're coming forward, all those applause are going to be excitement about the decision you alone just made. If someone else comes up with you, uh, that's for both of you. (laughs) All right? So I, I don't know. Here's what I do know. I know that God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He wants to be in a relationship with you. But I also know that Satan has a plan for your life. And he wants nothing else but for you to stay right in your seat. You feel that tug right now. You know that when I invite you to come up here, you're supposed to come. You're supposed to get up on your feet and come up here. You already know that God's calling you to do that. But Satan is trying to convince you to stay in your seat. And I want to encourage you, don't don't listen to that, that voice. Maybe you need to bring someone up with you. Maybe it'll be helpful to grab a friend who's already a follower of Jesus and say, hey, will you go do this with me? You can do that. Maybe you're in this room and you've already made a decision to follow Christ, but you've never been baptized. And today will be the day that you get baptized. And I want you to know, if you come forward, I'm not going to force you to get baptized today. Maybe you want to wait until next Sunday or Sunday after that so that people can be here to watch you do that. Uh, We're not going to make anyone get baptized today, but if you come forward and you want to get baptized today, we're going to take care of that this morning. All right, so the time's up. We're at zero seconds. If you're in this room and you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to get baptized, I want to invite you to come stand right here at the stage. Now's the time to do it. I, I practiced my lunges this morning, so I'm, <laughs> worship team, we're going to go long. Um, all right, you all, listen, maybe you're still in here and you know you're supposed to be up here, it's not too late, okay? I want to ask you guys to turn towards me, and I'm going to have you, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he's going to save you, and then we have the opportunity to take that initial step of obedience and baptism, and if you would like to do that today, we have everything you would need to be able to get baptized today. We're going to play, we're going to just keep going with songs until everybody who wants to get baptized has been baptized. Some of you out there, you're going to watch baptisms happen. And you're going to be like, you know, I should have gone up. It's not too late. You can still come up. Just come, come find us. I'm going to have you say with your mouth out loud what we call our good confession, okay? If you're in this room and you're a brother or sister in Christ, you can say this good confession out loud too because you've already believed this to be true, right? So here's what I want you to say. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
the Son of the living God. That He came to this earth and lived a perfect life that I could not live so that He could die for me for the forgiveness of my sins. And then He rose again so that one day I can too. And I have taken Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Oh, man. All right, here's what I hear. Yeah. Thank you for choosing to celebrate Easter with us online. We as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. As always, you can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings. And remember this, you belong at ACC.